very much. Um, I'm very excited to be here and I've been listening to what has been said by the delegation from Romania and um, Save the Children and it's been very exciting to hear what's happening in other parts of the world and how the whole world is mobilizing itself to really achieve this as the SDGs. Um, as the moderator mentioned, I'm, um, I'm representing a network of Baha'i inspired organizations in Africa um, that basically is striving to see how to promote education at the grassroots and how to build capacity in communities to take charge of the education of the younger generation and to be able to ensure that the younger generation, children of primary school age, are able to access quality education, same like what children in any other part of the world will be able to access. And, um, but before going into that, I just wanted to mention that um, in the work of many Baha'i-inspired organizations, the work of many Baha'i-inspired organizations focuses a lot at the community level. And really, the long-term vision is how to help a community cater for all dimensions of its development, basically. But also, we recognize that we neither have the capacity at this stage nor the resources to be able to assist the community to look at all dimensions of its development. So usually, it starts with one small effort or looking at one particular dimension, and in this particular case, education. But then there's a recognition that we're starting with education, but then the possibility of things could grow complex very quickly over time. So then back to what these organizations are trying to do. And again, it's a, on a quite a small scale, and it's a very modest thing, but it's permitting us to kind of learn a bit about how we can assist communities to be able to cater for the educational needs of their children. Um, usually the communities that we work with are in rural settings, the majority are in rural settings, a few are in urban cent uh, settings, but um, the majority are in rural settings, especially in rural settings where um, schools, they, they don't really have access to schools. And even where they do have access to schools, the government hasn't really been able to provide enough schools. And so classrooms are still saturated with more than 100 children to a teacher. Or sometimes there's one school for four or five villages and it's not really sufficient. Or sometimes there's, the teachers are just not enough and or the teachers don't want to move to rural places because they prefer the urban centers. And so then it makes it a bit challenging for children in such settings to have access to good education. So then such communities, usually then, the organizations will start a conversation with them about what they think is possible that they themselves can do to be able to, to educate their own children because the government can do as much as it wants and most of the time the demand is more than what the government can do. And so rather than wait till the time when a school will come or more teachers will come, what can the community itself do to start catering for the education of its children. And so this conversation starts. And where the members of the community, its leaders, show a willingness to participate in an effort to respond to the educational needs of their children, then, um, then uh, the idea is introduced of them being able to start a school, for example, a school that um, won't start all at once. It won't have all the grades all at once, but the school that's going to grow organically over time, which will start with a preschool, which is fairly easy to organize, and which it's easy to find someone who can, who can teach at that level. And then this school, depending on the availability of resources, human resources in that community, but also the willingness of the community to continue, that school can grow and add a grade each year. And so usually once the community agrees to do that, then they also help to think about who can be the initial teacher. 
And these teachers come from within the community. So the idea is not to get someone from outside. It's really to get someone from within the community who knows the community, who is familiar with the people in it, who knows its realities. And, um, and thought is given to what kind of person, ideally, who is, uh, will, will be, can, can start this, excuse me, can start this process. But then also the conversation continues with the, with the community about, well, how are you going to sustain this person? Maybe he's a farmer, or maybe his source of livelihood is true farming, but maybe it's going to take time now to spend with children. So thought has to be given to how he's going to be sustained. And um, the community has to think of ways by which they are going to do that. Um, there are, many, there are many ways by which communities approach this. I can't get into that right now, but I could answer questions about that later on. Um, and so once this individual is now identified, then the organization starts training them. But then it's, I think it's, uh, I'd like to maybe share a bit about the conception then of a teacher that we're trying to work with, we're working with. And basically what we see in this individual who arises to start teaching, it's not just a teacher whose work is limited to the classroom, who is just involved, who is just going to teach reading and writing and a few mathematical skills to children, but it's really someone who can become an agent of change in the community. So one skill set that he's going to uh, develop is that of um, teaching teaching children. Mm -hmm. But then another, and others that he's going to have to develop is one of being able to think about other aspects of community life and how he can contribute to those and how he can mobilize others to, to, to work together to achieve certain goals, development goals in the community. And so then the training is structured quite rigorous and structured in a way that they look at pedagogy and content. How do you teach this lesson? How do you teach A, B, C, and all these things? But then also, they, they, they look at um, their community, and they try to understand, understand their community. What is the reality of their community? And what are the needs of their community? And how can they contribute to improving some aspects of their, the life of their community over time? The content also then helps them conceive of their work as service before a job. It's not a job that they are doing to get money, but really they are, they are teachers because they are motivated by desire to prepare the younger generation for the future. And this is their main motivation. And, it, and so they are helped to reflect and think about what are those qualities, what are those attitudes that as individuals who want to serve their communities, they need to develop in order to be able to do so effectively? What's the role of commitment, of determination, of sacrifice in what they are going to do? And prepare them mentally for, for that. And so then, once the teacher finish, finishes a training, he returns to his community, and usually communities will have figured out a way to start. Some people may offer part of their home to be the initial classroom. Because also something we realized was that, and we decided not to put a lot of emphasis on in the beginning, was that if we're going to start thinking of infrastructure and asking communities to put up infrastructure, or even bringing um, funds from outside to put up infrastructure, it was, on, from the onset, going to be challenging, and it may be very difficult. It may take away the, the ownership of the community. So the community is asked to think of, what do you have? Some people may offer a room and say, let's start here. Others may offer maybe a church in the community may say, oh, we only go to church on Sundays, so why don't you use the building during the week? Or someone will say, oh, I can provide, I can build something. Or the chief of the village will say, we have this community center, we don't use it that much, maybe you can start there. 
But then the community really is over time had to think about how they can put something that would be for the school itself. And so once the teacher returns, then the organization also then continues working with him. Because again, the training is conceived not as one something that happens once, but it's continue, conceived as a continuous process. And so there is a time when they come together and they study and they familiarize themselves with what they need to do. But then throughout the year, two to three times throughout the year, they are visited, they are, someone comes to meet them and talk with them about how what they are doing and uh, try to identify what each teacher's challenges are and try to see how to help them surmount those challenges. They also benefit from spaces throughout the year where they come meet with other teachers doing the same thing just to reflect on what's, what they are doing and see how they can assist each other in um, overcoming certain challenges that they may face. And so then, this continues year after year, and where, like I mentioned, where the possibilities exist, the next, an additional person is identified to, to be a teacher. So the first teacher advances with his student, with his children, to the next grade, and he goes to be trained for grade one. And then another teacher comes up, someone else volunteers to be another teacher, and he starts at the preschool level. Really the idea that the simplest thing a person can start with, it's, it's best to start with the simplest thing and then build capacity over time for more complex things. And so um, over the past, I think 10 years, this has been going on. Again, on yeah. a very modest scale in a few countries in Africa. And we've been able to see in some countries, uh, communities that have been able to finish a primary cycle and are beginning to have teachers who are now able to teach at all levels. And we're beginning to see certain interesting things happening. For ex uh, going through a seven year process of seven years of training, um, by the time some teachers read the fourth, fifth year, um, they start, they become like partners of the organization and start taking on some of the, doing some of the things that the organization was doing. So for example, they start assisting newer teachers to navigate through the, the initial stages of what it means to be a teacher in the classroom. They are the ones, they are very close and they are able to, to, assist, to assist their colleagues. But then also we start seeing that some of these communities are beginning to have a cadre of people who are quite knowledgeable compared to a few years ago, and who then, as part of, as a, who then the community turns to, to help them think about other aspects of the development of their, of their, their community. And um, I think the moderator said I should wrap up soon. I think I got excited and just forgot about time. But just to say that um, from, what, from, from that, we, we begin to see that these teachers then become people through whom we can then start having, um, introducing other dimensions of community development. For example, agriculture. They are able to help the community access knowledge regarding agriculture. And so, for example, in some places, help them um, think of new ways by which they can um, farm that will maximize their yield, but drawing on knowledge that's not accessible, not available in the community. And many other things, literacy and um, um, health, are other things also that more and more the communities are able to, to access through the teachers. So um, we're very excited. This is like a frontiers of what we are learning. And by no means are we saying that's the solution to education at the grassroots. But we are very hopeful that this approach could really help, could help us really thinking about how do we 
raise people in the community who then can be protagonists of change and can spearhead development processes in their communities. Focusing on education, yes, but also having the capacity to look at other dimensions. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, I think in um, connection to the question my brother from Nigeria asked, um, um, right now we are not yet in Nigeria. Again, like I mentioned, it's, it's really the past few years has really been trying because we really wanted to learn. And so also we tried not to have too much on our hands that we couldn't handle. But with the experience we are gaining, uh, I think it's helping build our confidence that it is possible. And so then the future, in the future, we're looking to spread to more countries in Africa. So hopefully in the near future, in the next few years, maybe conversations will start with like, to see how it's possible in places like Nigeria. But then, um, so we welcome very much the collaboration of other organizations who are also very interested in this question of developing capacity at the grassroots. So in relation to the question uh, about um, who pays teachers and what facilities do they have access, the schools have, um, I think in, uh, we went in with a certain conception that each community has within it the capacity to really generate its own resources. And that what our role was, was to help them think about that and not so much give them what they, they thought they needed. So in many cases, when the program started, many communities will say, but you need to pay the teachers. And we made a firm resolution that we weren't going to do that because it was important that they, there's a rise in capacity in the community to be able to see how they can mobilize their resources. And also to realize that the teacher we're talking about wasn't a government paid teacher. He was living in the community. He probably had property in the community. He had a farm, he had, he, he had family and things like that. So the kind of support that he needed wasn't the same kind of support that was going to be given to someone who lived in the south and is taken to go and teach in the north. So then the community had to come together in consultation with the teachers to figure out what was a, a good enough amount that ensured that the teacher didn't suffer, in a sense. And in most cases, these uh, funds for, to pay the teacher came from school fees that the parents would pay. And in cases where sometimes they couldn't find cash, they, they don't have access to cash, they will figure out other ways of assisting the teacher. They'll go and work on his farm. They'll organize themselves to work on his farm because maybe he was a farmer, he's a farmer by, that's what he does. But then now that he's teaching, he hasn't got the opportunity to farm and he's not able to harvest and sell and generate income. So then they will do that. In other cases, they've actually found, created a plot for the school where the community farms on and sell the harvest to generate income for the teacher, but also for, for um, the development of the school, questions related to infrastructure and any other needs that the school will have, chalk, blackboards, all the benches, and all these um, other needs of the school. So basically, that's, that's, uh, that's a conversation that we have with the community. You say, don't think of yourself as poor and deprived. Think of yourself as people who maybe individually you are poor, but together you are able to do things that you couldn't imagine you could do. And think of ways by which you can respond to the needs of your teacher. With the idea that it is your children, they are your responsibility. And if this person has reason to assist them, to educate them, find ways by which you can assist him and ensure that he's able to, to do it.
So, but then we also recognize that many communities in the world, especially in rural settings, there's a limit to what they can do. There's, it's not like we're, we, it's not like um, they are going to be able to build very uh, beautiful buildings for the school and things like that. So we recognize that there's a limit and there's always going to be need for external inputs. There's going to be need for sometimes funds to come from outside to assist them. But then we, give, we think about it very carefully and we try to see at what point do we do that. And we try and wait to see the point where we feel the community has taken ownership of the process to the point that external aid doesn't make them put their hands down and, and rest and say, well, now we've, we don't have anything to do anymore. But the realization that that external aid is just coming to reinforce what they are already doing. And so maybe in some places, they say we need a classroom, we want a classroom, and they will mold bricks, thousands of bricks. And they'll say, well, we've molded the bricks, we've put up the walls, we've mobilized people, in the, the youth, the women, everyone in the community to put up the walls and everything. But we really don't have the means to put up a proper ceiling. And so then maybe some funds come in to assist them with that. But really, in such a way that it's not taking away their sense of this is our own achievement. And so then in that process, in the conversations with community, when they are thinking about infrastructure, then they also help to think about some of the facilities that the school needs. But again, not to think of something out of this world, but to look in their own environment. How do they respond to such questions in their own environment? And of course, if it doesn't respond, say in the case of toilets, if it doesn't respond to certain hygienic norms, that's where the teacher then is able to help them think about how do we do something that responds to the standards of hygiene. That, won't, that will not uh, actually be a, a place where children go and get diseases. For how do we ensure that the children who play in the sand and everything develop the habit of washing their hands and things. So all these things are part of the conversation that takes place with the community. Unfortunately, things like libraries, we haven't yet reached there. And it's, um, it's, it's, it's one of the next things that we are looking at. A few schools have started on their own initiative, having creating their own libraries, but on a wide scale, not so much. Um, but it was interesting. Um, it's interesting that even without some of these things, libraries which are very important because also they help broaden the, the knowledge base of the students. But it was interesting for us to observe that even without some of these things like a library or all the educational materials and things that may be helpful for the education of a child, these children were still surpassing children who were going to other schools. And so then it helped us realize that key, very key, was the, the teacher and the teacher being very good and that a lot of time and energy had to go into training him. But then when these other things are put into place, then those things will help reinforce the education of a child. But if you have a teacher who is not good, but then you have all these other things, the child can learn something, but in terms of how far he can go, it's going to be very limited. Um, and to the question regarding girls, um, I think like I mentioned in the beginning, uh, this Baha'i inspired efforts, and those who are familiar with the efforts of uh, the Baha'is know that um, equality of men and women, that equal opportunities to men and women is a fundamental principle of the faith. So embedded in this effort is that boys and girls should have equal access to education. And in the initial conversation, again, that's a very key thing that's talked about. And parents are helped to understand that they need to send their, children, their, their girls to school also. So I thank you. It's just uh, getting on in time. And I, I recognize that there are a lot of pressing needs.